so we're going to get started. Uh, this is Lars Geerth, and the talk is Protocol Tactics. Hello. Oh, yeah, it works. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. It's nice to be here. Uh, I keep coming back to Toronto, and uh, it's always just really nice. So thank you, Ben, and, and Don, and Sarah, and, uh, and Gary, and Yurko. And I brought a little present that I found in very old IRC logs. Um, it's the very first logo of Toronto MeshNet. And let me flip the camera. And it's this. And <laughs> It was like three years ago, I think. Do you have it? Good. <laughs> so tactics, protocol tactics. Uh, a tactic is a conceptual action aiming at the achievement of a goal. And um, this talk was early on supposed to be very technical and then I, um, like very engineering heavy, and then I uh, looked at some of the tweets and videos from yesterday. I'm really bummed out I missed yesterday. It looked like a lot of fun and really interesting. Um, and so I broadened it a bit um, to a bit more than protocol tactics. And why, why am I so focused on tactics? I'm um, really interested in networking. Um, I've been involved in the CGDNS community for a while and in my local MeshNet community in Berlin called Freifunk. Um, and also in the IPFS and LIP2P communities. And, um, so while looking into internet routing, I stumbled um, upon this white paper called The Art of Peering, The Peering Playbook. So Dr. Peering is a uh, website that's all about internet routing and the practice of it, and, um, which is really interesting. And there's, these, there's a bunch of tactics. They all have names. And um, yeah, so they interviewed hundreds of, of peering operators, network operators, and there's tactics like the very obvious direct approach, just talk to the people and figure it out. But there's also um, different, maybe less ethical tactics. For example, the, um, wait, oh, it's not here on the screenshot. But one is, for example, to, uh, to call up a NOC, a network operation center that you're not peered with, and to play as if there would be an outage on an existing peering to trick them into actually establishing peering with you. So <laughs> that's a funny tactic. And um, yeah, so this thinking of this stuff and tactics kind of stuck with me. And there's also an RFC document by, uh, by the IETF called What Makes for a Successful Protocol. And they, uh, a couple of years ago, examined a bunch of different protocols that became wild successes or which were meant to become or expected to become wild successes but didn't. And um, it came up with a, with a couple of, of shared factors between these. So there's a positive net value. Obviously, it needs to solve a problem. Um, it, it can be deployed incrementally, so it doesn't have to be this one big push, um, which, which is supposed to become a disaster, but you can deploy it step by step. Um, open code availability seems obvious by now. Um, freedom from usage restrictions, again, GPL, right? And this whole family of licenses. Uh, open specification availability, so you can develop your own. Uh, implementations of the protocol, open maintenance processes. Um, so development of, of the protocol or of its implementations is not like constrained or, or hidden in one uh, department within one company, but it's actually um, open and everybody's invited. And finally, good technical design. There's also protocols which have succeeded despite good technical design, um, but it definitely helps a lot. Um, so these were just the basic success factors. There's, uh, like, they, in, this, in this RFC, they have this little graph to illustrate the difference between a basic success and the wild success. I should have put this up there, uh, thinking about it. And so the x-axis is, um, in this little graph, is um, the use cases. And the y-axis is the amount of, of spread, how, how, how wide it has spread. And, um, they, set, they define basic success as the protocol is used exactly for what it was meant. And then wild success is this big box around the basic success, um, around the use cases it was intended for. And it means it was, uh, it's being used for much, much more than it was meant for in terms of use cases, in terms of scale, um, and all that. So factors for that are extensibility, no hard scalability bounds, threats sufficiently mitigated. Um, so that's where I'm kind of 
coming from with this thinking about about tactics. Um, this is a little timeline of protocols. I don't know when you were born. I was born in 89, so FTP, SMTP, IP, DNS, BGP, they all are older than I am. So basically grew up knowing nothing else. Um, and so it might seem like there is no alternative, um, similar to, to other structures in our lives. But actually, there are a thousand alternatives and more. And um, yeah, so that brings me to the question, what are common tactics and community networks? Um, um, I know a couple of you are, are involved in MeshNet communities um, or in, in other kinds of uh, community networks. Um, so I'm really curious what kind of tactics you can think of um, from your experiences in that. And I don't know, legal tactics, community building tactics, protocol tactics, technical tactics. Um, and this little tweet, uh, this little pet that, that Sarah mentioned earlier, just go crazy, add all kinds of stuff to it. Um, my presentation is not going to be too long, so we're going to have quite a bunch of time to, um, to discuss. So we all probably, I'm, I'm just going to uh, assume that uh, operate with or work on this stuff with, with, a with a couple of common principles. Accessibility, for example, um, sustainability, resilience, ubiquity, impact, and fun. They're not in, in, in a particular order, but I um, saw the principle of fun on the slides from a presentation from yesterday. I think it's really important. And the first tactic is probably the most obvious one is to just open source everything you do. Um, so it's available for people to look at, not just in your own community, but also in other communities. Code, documentation, processes, meetings, the activities you do. Um, MeshNet communities are, are relying on, on building out the actual physical network on rooftops in uh, community spaces, at homes, um, in housing projects, anywhere. Um, and these are great for inviting people and, and doing stuff together. Next one is a bit funny. It's, uh, it's pretty specific to Germany, where I'm from, where I'm living. Um, Störerhaftung. Um, so it's related to copyright. It's liability for disturbance. So whatever happens over your internet line, um, you are in part reliable for. That, that rule was, that law was scrapped last year, finally. Um, but that was something that German communities had to deal with for, yeah, since they began working. So 15, 16 years. And um, what Freifunk started doing at some point was, because it came up every time um, when they were talking to people, hey, want to take part in this? Want to share your internet connection? Oh, but what about Störerhaftung? <laughs> and so they started operating VPN services, became, formally became uh, an internet provider, um, which freed them of the liability. And in parallel, they fought this law legally when people were affected by it, um, but also politically. And, and that ended up as a success last year, finally. Um, another tactic is permissionlessness. Um, how, what steps are needed, what actions are needed from you, or what permissions, what forms, um, to, be actually, to actually be able to take part in this network, to participate. And um, usually that's IP addresses. In Freifunk, there's a form, a web form at least, that you fill out, just a bunch of contact data. It's not very hard, but there is a central system where you need to apply and get the permission and the credentials to, to enter the network. And that's not necessary. That's, that's purely a function of, of, of what the protocols used in this network require. And it can work differently. So CGDNS um, encrypts all traffic anyway. So you have cryptographic keys anyway. So why not use these as, as your address? Um, also makes it a lot easier to configure because you just run one command to generate that stuff, and that's all. Automatic updates, um, kind of in conflict with, with, an, with a DIY or uh, do it with others approach. 
Um, but well, it, it's a trade-off, and it could be opt-in, for example. And if users decide to to use to make use of automatic updates, um, you as a the network as a whole gets gets a lot more wiggle room for for experimentation, for fixing security holes, um, and generally for for moving along. Um, and Berlin, for, there, there's a couple of platform communities that that do offer automatic updates um, for for devices that people install at home or wherever, and they can move a lot faster. Um, while in Berlin, for example, there's I don't know, there's nodes on the network that haven't been updated in 10 years. And it is, on the one hand, it's amazing. They're still working. On the other hand, um, it slows everything down. And um, the, it, it's a lot of baggage for, for moving ahead with protocol improvements. Seize the moment. Sometimes there's just really good occasions for building out the network. Um, the, which, if you're prepared well, you can move immediately and gain a couple of new nodes, for example. Um, in Berlin, there, I don't know what, what's up here, but in Berlin, every now and then, people squat houses. Um, and it's proven really useful for the network, on the one hand, um, to, to just be prepared, have a kit available that you can just give those people and install it with them and on, on the same day sometimes. And um, on the other hand, it's these two communities, in those cases, like squat, people who squat um, or are interested in, in housing issues, and, and the platform community, on the other hand, they kind of reinforce each other in those cases, which, um, which is really nice. Um, and, and this also goes back to what someone was mentioned yesterday. I was just scrolling through stuff and haven't been able to actually watch any of the videos where they said if you want to build community networks and actual communities, then you don't just go there and install stuff, but you embed yourself in those communities, some, something along those lines. And that um, made a lot of sense to me. A tactic that hasn't worked very well often is just throwing everything out the window and starting from scratch. Um, hasn't worked with Firefox's predecessor, Netscape, um, because they just spent so much time on rewriting this new browser that the competition just had moved ahead and they never, they never finished that rewrite. And the IPv6 migration is, is, a, is also kind of a case of a, of a failed rewrite, because the, the largest issue with IPv4 by far was just the size of the address space. And we're still running out of addresses. We're even more running out of addresses than ever. But they, the engineers involved in, in specking out IPv6 um, added a ton more features to IPv6. Um, and so it, it, it could have just been IPv4 with a larger address space, and, um, which would have been a lot easier to, to implement, to migrate to, to use. Um, but instead, it became a whole new thing uh, you, that's, that's a graph that came up at, at one of the RIPE meetings. So RIPE is the regional registry for Europe and Northern Africa and for part of Western Asia. And it's, um, it's IPv6 adoption. So the red line is, well, let's start with the blue line. The blue line is nodes that are capable of IPv6 to begin with. And, IPv, uh, and the red line is nodes that actually prefer IPv6 over IPv4. If you look very closely at the right, and the last, well, that's, well, the beginning of 2018, it just plateaus. Um, and that has caused a lot of concern in, in RIPE and, and in other network organizations. Um, and that's not even at 50 or 60 percent, but 16, 17. Um, so that IPv6 migration is hardly a success so far. And we're already 20 years in. <laughs> but yeah, you saw that timeline, right? Some of these protocols are already 40, 45 years old, and that's, that's how fast or, or slow this stuff moves. Um, and, and the internet is such a complex system, such a complex economy, and, and that stuff just moves really slowly. And that's why a good understanding of, of tactics you can employ or others have employed is um, it's really useful.
because it, yeah. So another tactic is the hourglass, which is less of a, well, less of a tactic of acting. It's more a way of designing things and thinking of networks. And this, the hourglass model came up with IP because IP is just this really, this really thin layer. Um, and everything else is either built underneath or built on top. And um, IP is the common layer between all nodes on the internet and all other networks. And this allows you to put different physical pipes underneath. I know satellite internet was not conceivable um, when IP was, was conceived. Um, yeah, it's basically about figuring out the minimal common layer, drawing abstractions and, and interfaces that parts underneath can rely on, that parts above can rely on. Um, and then you can, yeah. It's a sim similar principle is what we uh, did in IPFS, where we tried to, well, we tried to make IPFS work with all the cryptographically linked, like hash linked data out there. So not just data that's been added with IPFS, but there's so much more in this, that Git versioning, um, all kinds of other versioning systems, Tahoe, LAFS, um, so much stuff that uses cryptographic hashes for uh, linking. Um, and IPLD tries to be this tiny little layer um, between the transports for that data, how, is, how, it is being, uh, how it is being moved around, and the applications uh, on top of that data that create this data and um, make use of it. Another tactic that um, took a bit more space in the old version of, of this presentation is future proofing. So any idea what, what that is? <laughs> yeah, that's definitely right. Um, I mean the thing underneath. Yeah, it's a hash. What kind of hash? SHA-1? MD5? SHA-256? Yeah, you're right. It's a good hash, but it's hardly recognizable, right? You kind of rely on, on the length of it. It's 40 bytes. Uh, no, 20 bytes, but 40 characters in, um, in hex. And, uh, but there's other hash functions that are also, that also emit 20 bytes. Um, Blake 2B, for example. So you get a hash and have no idea what to do with it. It only, it only makes sense within one system, but once you leave that system, you're suddenly out of, out of luck. And um, another example, what's that? Yeah, one option. Might be an emoji as well. Who knows? Um, and that one is pretty obvious, but all the assumptions in there are, for example, this TCP, this IP, there's TCP, there's DNS, there's TLS, um, there's port 443, um, all, all those assumptions in there. Why does HTTP have to work over TCP only? Um, the ITF is working on, on, on different transport protocols, but browsers, command line tool, everything that, that knows HTTP assumes TCP. So whenever there's another option, it can't be used. Um, so that's why we came up with, with multi-formats in, in the IPFS project, which, which is a way to, um, to have self-describing values, addresses, cryptographic hashes, in this case hashes, right, multi-hash. And we just prepend a couple of bytes in front of each of those values, uh, which describes what it is. So first byte is the algorithm, second byte is the length, and then the actual value of the hash. And so suddenly your hashes are portable. You can make sense of them in any system. Um, and did similar things for networking addresses, for base encoding, base 16, base 32, base 58, all those. Um, and for a few more, for networking addresses, it looks like this. Uh, it looks a bit more verbose than the URL you were seeing earlier, but it means you can describe any kind of network stack that you can think of. Um, so, for example, the last one, HTTP over, uh, over Onion. Why not? Um, IPFS over Quick, over UDP. Um, 
I know I'm thinking of yeah, there's there's certain certain network construction network stack constru constructions already existing that we can't properly um, address. For example, I don't know. There's a corporate network or otherwise private network, and you get access to it via SSH, and then there's HTTP services in there. And um, how do you address those? Um, that's the basic idea of, of multi-address. Another tactic is anti-ossification. So. When a protocol can't evolve because deployments freeze its extensibility points, we say it has ossified. And the most prominent example of that is TCP and TLS. TCP has been, along, has been along for so long that everybody assumes it's never going to change. And so uh, middle boxes, routers, all kinds of devices make assumptions about how a TCP stream looks. And then when you suddenly use one of those many bits in, in a TCP packet, then those middle boxes start rejecting your traffic. Um, so the planned successor to HTTP 1, 1.1, which is HTTP 2, and then its little cousin, Quick, they, they're kind of two branches of the same new protocol. Um, they said, okay, let's use UDP instead of TCP to get out of the way of those nasty middle boxes. And then we're gonna encrypt all that, and then, um, and then do TCP jobs, so rel reliability congestion control within that encryption so that middle boxes can't mess with it anymore. And well, but the good thing is, you, or the nice side effect is you encrypt everything, which is always good. Not, another tactic is backward compatibility, which is also less concrete and more uh, a bit broader because there's so much to consider depending on what you're actually dealing with. Um, but the gains are, are enormous. Um, so you lower the adoption cost for, for people who are interested in it, uh, in, in, in what you're building, um, makes it a lot easier to, to experiment on, as a result of that, and it unlocks a mass of existing stuff. So that's one of the big problems with IPv6 again, right? Um, stuff doesn't support it properly, and, um, and if you're backward compatible, that, that's not an issue. The most interesting tactic is probably epidemics. Um, software that whose installations are a distribution channel of their own. So in, in the Freifun community, or um, close to the Freifun community, there's a project called Cowl, and it's kind of a mix of a protocol and a bunch of ap applications. It's an app for mobile devices and for laptops as well, which allows you communication, uh, I don't know, text messaging, sending and receiving files and all that on an ad hoc mesh network and it's designed for um, it's designed for a situation where there's a blackout of, of, of traditional communications media you rely on. Um, and how it works is you start the application, it's, it opens a Wi-Fi network uh, to communicate with, with the other nodes obviously and then where in university or coffee shop networks you would get a little login page you instead get an option to download the thing. So the people who don't have it yet can just download it from a friend. And yeah, I, I kind of want to stir more questions uh, than, than answer them. And um, so I'd love to collect more, more tactics from all of you, from people who aren't here. Not necessarily today, but but over time, um, I keep presenting and discussing these ta these tactics, and so so that other meshnet communities can um, can profit from them. And how much time do I actually have left? Whoops. Um, oh wow. Ah, okay. I'm at half an hour. Good. So. Oh. Yeah, so if you have any questions or ideas, tactics of your own, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a question about the multi-protocol address. Um, and I was wondering, like, that seems to front load a lot of stuff that could be done as, um, like, some kind of handshake or a protocol negotiation or something. It front loads it into the address. I was wondering, 
uh, how you or whoever came up with that sort of analyze like how far you want to go like you know putting in the address versus having it negotiated at, at the time that it's requested Yep, so, yeah, great question. <laughs> um, so negotiation is always a, a, a um, well, it's, it's a job of, of dip implementations on different ends, right? And if you, and it also means adding all this room for, the, for these different options and, and negotiations into the protocols. And if you look at protocols that have done that in the past, um, earlier versions of TLS, for example, TLS 1.1, 1.2, you see that it, it had all those options for different um, encryption algorithms, hash functions, all those. And when you implement something, of course, you have the desire to be complete, feature complete. And then you end up with implementations that have a bunch of stuff in them that's not really used, not really maintained, while the actual standard that's recommended and used by everybody is probably exactly one or two um, or two of these options. And so we wanted to, to avoid that basically, but still get the flexibility. Uh, well, I, I was wondering, um, wouldn't you have a similar kind of thing uh, in whatever is designed to read these addresses where somebody would want to implement the, you know, complete, the feature complete uh, one, like, you know, uh, have it do the UDP and the uh, TCP and stuff like that. I, I'm wondering how that, how this changes that, mm -hmm. uh, that aspect of wanting to focus on one protocol versus many. Mm. Trouble coming up with a, with a good reply to that, actually. <laughs> so I must have I must get back to it sometime in the afternoon or tomorrow. Hi, could you go back to I? And sorry, I've yeah. been a bit in and out, so I might have missed it. But I'm really interested in the anti ossification. Yeah. And was it that one or um, the one which I think was kind of talking about forcing automatic updates or sort of these trade offs? around um, kind of the amount of uh, autonomy or control maybe some people mm -hmm. have at in kind of like their participation in a protocol or something. Oh. Um, I don't know if you have any more thoughts or could expand a bit on that, but um, I, I don't think I have anything particularly cogent to say, just that I, I feel like that is kind of putting its finger <sighs> on a thing that is a really active tension. And I just think of like recent discussions around like federation with like, um, matrix or, or like how people feel about signal and and like how who gets to um, like if they're separate or like federated um, when it's deployed over like using WhatsApp as the same protocol stuff like that so I don't know if you have any more thoughts there um, but I would yeah, I mean love it's, to hear it's, them. It, it's a huge trade-off right and that um, and how you balance that depends on <laughs> what your situation is what your community looks like and, and what the people in it feel like and I, and I think about automatic updates, I'm thinking, well, they should definitely be opt-in or opt-out. There should be an option to, well, decide for it or against it for the user, for the user themselves. Um, and maybe, yeah, I don't know, maybe it could work like updates in operating systems where you just get bugged with it, hey, update, update, update. But then a router at your home doesn't really have a display or anything that yeah. could tell you that it wants an update. Um, I mean, whatever you come up with there, it, it should rather empower users to interact with their device and, and, and the network and the community than, than preventing it. It should not make, make the router a little black box that that keeps updating itself and then breaks and then, oh hey, you're good with computers, right? <laughs> Should more like be something that invites uh, playfulness and experimentation. When you were saying that, I, I was kind of thinking about kind of Oops. when people purposely maybe add friction when you use the thing to kind of like force you to notice 
that you're using it. So maybe some of these trade-offs are coming from a, a, the existing pattern of trying to like abstract or hide um, inner workings. Yeah. And so what comes out of revealing them instead? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank okay, you, so Liz. the pet will stay there, and um, I'm gonna prepare some follow-up with a bit more reading, maybe a bit, a few more tactics. Um, yeah, and feel free to add more. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.